But, now watch this, as it is written. Now you see this? This is an Old Testament scripture, and he's quoting from the Old Testament. And he's sitting from the Old Covenant, right? He says, but as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Now, people say, oh yes, amen, that's right. Okay, now watch. Verse 10. First word, but. Right? Now, notice this. <clears throat> I think we even mentioned this the other day. If I told you, or you came to me and said, uh, Brother Craig, you got $5, I need $5 to do this. And I, and I said, yeah, man, I got $5, I'd love to give it to you, no problem. It ain't going to hurt me to give it to you. I'd love to give it to you. I've got the $5, matter of fact, I got, got it right here. But, but. And when I say but, what does that mean? You ain't getting the $5. Isn't that right? No matter how long I told you, I wanted to give it to you. When I said but, what that means is, forget everything I just said, and now I'm going to tell you the truth and the facts. Isn't that right? That's what it means. Paul is quoting the Old Testament. He says, I hath not seen, neither is ear heard, neither has it entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. We hear that quoted all the time in church. Oh, we don't know what God has prepared for us. Oh, we don't know God's thoughts are above our thoughts, his ways above our ways. Okay, that's what, that's Old Covenant. That was unborn again people. If your God's ways aren't your ways, you're not saved. You understand? The way of the transgressor is hard, but the way of the righteous is blessed. Amen? So you, can't, you couldn't say all that stuff. Now back then in the Old Covenant, they could because they weren't born again. And His ways was above it. His thoughts were above their thoughts. But that's not you. Because you have His Spirit. And if you have His Spirit, you can have His thoughts. Alright? Now watch. He says... But God hath, past tense, I mean it's already done, revealed them, what? The things that I hadn't seen and ear hadn't heard and the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. Right? That hadn't entered the hearts of men. But God has revealed these things to us by His Spirit. So you can't say, well, you know, I hadn't seen and ear hadn't. God works in mysterious ways. Yeah, to people that don't know Him. Right? To people that know Him, He's not mysterious at all. He says, For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So in other words, anything you've learned about God, you got it by the Spirit. You didn't figure it out. The Spirit revealed it. Okay? Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Why? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Do you hear that? Thing, he, he gave us the Spirit so we could know what He has freely given us. Not things we have to buy from Him. Not things we have to work for. But things that are freely given to us. The purpose of the Spirit is so you can know these things. Amen? Alright. Which things also we speak? Not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, let me just explain something. If someone walked in that door, maybe their car broke down and they'd come in here for help or something, and they heard us in here talking, and we're talking about laying hands on the sick and tumors disappearing and, you know, dead raising and all that kind of stuff, and this person just off the street, don't know nothing, all right? They're going to stand back there and think, this is crazy. This is, this is, I've never heard anything like that. You know, they're, they're going to be thinking, healing? Yeah, I know healing. It's a scalpel in a doctor's hand. It's, it's a shot. It's medicine. That's healing. What, what are they talking about laying hands? These people actually think that they're going to put their hand on a person and sickness is going to disappear. That's crazy. But look at you. You're here learning it. See how far you've already come from where you used to be? That's the difference. See, you've already, now this seems normal to you. You know, thinking about healing, thinking about God, thinking about power, and that, normal. And used to, to, to an average person, that is light years away from where they are. Isn't that right? And here you're like, well, I don't know anything. I don't know that much. I just Look how far you've come. Amen? This is normal to you. Now, he says, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Talking in tongues... 
Your loved ones is unsaved. I, I, that's gibberish. I don't get it. That makes no sense. Well, there's your verse. Of course they don't get it. They're natural. It's foolishness to them. Quit trying to explain it. Just live it and let them see it, what it does in your life. Right? They don't care about the explanation. <clears throat> they are foolishness to them. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things. All right, stop right there. Next time somebody says, well, right, we shouldn't judge. Okay, well, when you get spiritual, you can judge. Right? I'm spiritual, I'm going to judge. The spiritual man judges all things. I'm judging all things. Well, yeah, but you shouldn't judge other people. Well, I'm not judging you of you going to hell. I'm not telling you that. But I can judge. You keep living this way, you will end up in hell. Right? I can, I can judge your actions. I can judge your lifestyle. And I'm not telling you you are going to hell no matter what. Because that's judging you and pronouncing a final sentence. But I can tell you this. You stay on that path, you'll end up in hell. You need to turn around. Right? I'm judging your actions. I'm judging your fruit. Right? Now, if you say I'm judging you, that's because you and the fruit with you is pretty close. <laughs> all right? He says, but he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For, now, watch this. Again, he quotes an Old Testament verse. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? And what's the next word? But. But we have the mind of Christ. Now, you're going to notice, you go through all of Paul's writings, and every time he quotes an Old Testament verse... Almost every time, the next word is but. Why? Because the old covenant, he said, look, used to be, that was true. But no more. Why? Because the old covenant has passed away and we have a new covenant. Alright? Now, remember, and watch this. He says, and I, brethren, now listen, this is the important part. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. You hear that? But as unto carnal even as unto babes in Christ. So what do we got? We got spiritual, then we got carnal. Now we know that carnal, according to this, to be carnal is to be a baby in Christ. So if being carnal, if you got spiritual and carnal, and carnal is a babe, what is spiritual? Mature, right? Now watch. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Okay, why? For hitherto, that means up till now, you were not able to bear it. And neither yet now are you able. Alright? Stop right there. Now notice what we got. We got spiritual carnal. We got... He says, you're a baby in Christ if you're carnal. So that means if you're spiritual, you're mature in Christ, right? Then he says, okay, I couldn't give you meat. I could only give you milk because you're a babe. Well, a baby drinks milk. So that means that whenever you mature, you're going to eat meat. Right? So meat is connected with mature, with spiritual. Milk is connected with carnal and with being a baby. Right? Now Paul said, you are carnal. You are babes in Christ. And I could not give you meat because you are babes. As a matter of fact, you couldn't bear it up till now. And even now, I cannot give you meat. Isn't that right? But he's writing a letter to him. And in this letter, it's amazing because we just read this letter and we say, Oh yeah, oh we're going to study this. Now we're getting into this. And this letter, this word means this in the Greek. And people are, oh man, we're getting the meat now. Oh, this is meat. Oh, we're digging this stuff out. Okay. Excuse me, but you cannot find meat where Paul said he didn't put any. <laughs> right? Paul said there is no meat in Corinthians. You get that? You can't dig. There's no meat in this book. You get that? There's no meat there. You do not find anywhere in the Bible where it says, eat the meat of the Word. You know what it says? Desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. See, this whole book is milk. No meat. No meat in this book. Not at all. You say, wait a minute, Curry, you're scaring me. No, you're coming alive. Right? We're peeling those layers off. Let me prove it to you. He says... <clears throat> Neither yet now are you able. That means there's no milk, I mean no meat in Corinthians. For you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Oh, wait a minute. What's wrong with walking as men? You're never told to be a man. You're told to walk as sons of God. Matter of fact, one translation even says, and you walk as mere mortal men. Why? Because you're not mere mortal men. Okay, if you're born again, you've already died. Right? You're going to live from now on. Right? Now your physical body may or may not, who knows about that, but I'll tell you this, you ain't dying. Right? 
Because you've already tasted death. And you won't taste it anymore. If you believe in me, right? If, even though he were dead, yet shall he live, right? All right, now watch this. He says, For while one says I'm of Paul, and another says I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed? Even as the Lord gave to every man, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And then he goes on. Now, he just said, I couldn't give you meat here in chapter 3, right? And he said, I couldn't include it in there, so there is no meat here. But, nine chapters later, he talks about the gifts of the Spirit. So even the gifts of the Spirit, now get this, what did he do with the gifts of the Spirit? He detailed what they were. But even that is not meat. You get it? Information cannot be meat. Alright, watch. Go with me to Hebrews. <clears throat> and actually, this is in your manual too. I mean, we're in chapter 2 of your manual. I think it's page 7. If you look in there, you can follow right along. And it'll go right along to it and it'll show you, you know, where we're going. But go to Hebrews chapter 5. Y'all getting anything out of this? Is this okay? <clears throat> All right, well, hang in there with me for just a couple more minutes. We'll try to get this done. Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to start about verse 11. And you can go back in and read all this because, again, I don't have time to do it all and I want you to know that I'm reading it in context. So go back and read it. But in verse 11, remember we've been talking about Melchizedek and how Jesus came after the order of Melchizedek and now he talks about the order of Melchizedek as a high priest. Verse 11, he says, Of whom, talking about Melchizedek, we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. You hear that? He, he's not saying it's hard for me to say. He's saying, it'd be hard for me to explain it to you because it'd be hard for you to hear it. I could tell you, but you wouldn't get it. Okay? He says, now, now he's going to tell you why you wouldn't get it. He says, for when for the time, in other words, there's a length of time here, you ought to be teachers. You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. In other words, he's telling these Hebrew Christians, look, you've been Christian long enough that you ought to be teaching others, and he says it to all of them, so all Christians should be teachers. You hear that? Why? Because all believers are supposed to be making disciples. Everybody in this room ought to have a disciple. Every one of you ought to be getting people born again and raising them up in Christ. Not getting them born again, or bringing them to church to get them born again, or, or getting them born again and then bringing them to church and saying, here you go, pastor, raise them up. No, that's your job. And you'll be surprised how much you will grow once you take responsibility for the spiritual growth of somebody. And you have to start praying for them and being there for them. So, he says, in other words, he said, you should have been teachers already and I have to come back here because you have become dull of hearing and I have to teach you what are the very basics all over again. He said, and have be now watch this, and have become such. They weren't always this way. So it shows the spiritual maturity is fluctuating, right? He says, and become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So he's telling them, he said, you guys have basically backslid to the point where you need milk again. He says, for every... Now he tells us what, what it is about milk and everything. But everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness because he is a baby. Right? Now what are we talking about? We're talking about the word of God, right? Spiritual milk. We're not talking about physical milk. We're talking about spiritual milk. Okay. Now, it, says, it doesn't say you're unskillful in the word of God. It says you're unskillful in the word of righteousness. In other words, once you understand who you are in Christ, that you are the righteousness of God in Christ, and you understand righteousness, which is the word of God. The word of righteousness is the word of God. But once you understand the word of God based on the righteousness of God in Christ, then everything changes, and you're no longer a baby after that. But until then, you're still a baby. Okay? He says, watch this, but strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Means mature. Even those who by reason of use. Hear that? Who get strong meat? People who use something, right? By reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, by reason of use. In other words, you get your you, you understand the word of righteousness and you start doing what's right and as you do what is right, you can understand this is right, that's wrong. It's no longer theory. It's no longer, well, I don't know. I'm not sure. What do you think? And you can tell that's right, that's wrong. This is good, that's evil. Well, that sickness, is that of God or is it of the devil? I don't know. Well, it's working something good in their life so it could be of God but, you know, it's also costing a lot of money they were going to send off to missions so it might be of the devil. I don't know. 
Okay, you're still a babe in Christ. You're still needing milk and not strong meat. Alright? Now watch. Then he says, remember chapter's not divine. Therefore, leaving the principles, leaving the basics of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. That word perfection means maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Okay, that's the foundation, repentance from dead works. Say, look, we're not going to go back and talk about repenting from dead works and turning away from that. We're not going to, I'm not going to be talking about that. And of faith towards God. Now, wait a minute. He says, don't, don't keep preaching about faith towards God. He said, I... You're telling me I'm going to move away from that? In other words, there should come a point where I don't have to teach about faith in God? Yeah, as soon as you teach it, people are to walk in it, and you shouldn't have to keep teaching it because people are walking in it. But if you stop teaching faith in God, it, come on, if you took out faith in God preaching, every church would shut down next Sunday because that's what they keep telling you. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Isn't it right? But at some point, we've got to quit preaching about it and actually everybody start doing it. Right? And then we can move away from talking about it and actually doing it. Right? I, I always tell everybody, it's funny because Jesus said, when he returns, shall he find faith on the earth? And I tell him, well, I don't know if he's going to find faith, but he's going to find a whole bunch of books and tapes about it. <laughs> right? I don't know if he's going to find anybody actually walking in it, but... All right. And he says, now watch this, a faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do, if God permit. Do you realize he's saying, look, let's move on. And let's move on past the basics. Do you realize these things are what's taught every Sunday everywhere? Why? Because we we'll always preach the lowest common denominator. If there's one person in there that's not saved, we'll come down to an evangelistic message. Rather than say, you know what? Hang in here. We'll talk with you, but we've got to work with the believers. You know, Maybe Sunday mornings ought to be evangelistic, and Wednesday nights be for the believers. That'll work. But at some point, that's why believers never grow. It's because all, all they ever hear is just... Milk. Constant milk. You understand? Alright. Now, go with me to John chapter 4. <clears throat> so what are we talking about? Spiritual maturity, right? Babes in Christ. Mature in Christ. Carnal, spiritual, milk, meat. Are we talking about physical meat or spiritual meat? Spiritual. Okay, just making sure you're listening. John, where are we going to go here? Yep, we're going to go to John chapter 4. Verse 1, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Now do you realize that the church is still trying to be Jacob? Do we still want to wrestle with God? And right, we're always wrestling with God, give me the blessing. God, give me the blessing. I'm wrestling with God. Okay, you don't have to wrestle for what you've been freely given. I mean, Ephesians 1, 3. That God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Right? So does that mean you're lacking anything? Then we need to quit pulling on God and saying, God, give. And start saying, God, I'm going out to give. Amen? All right. Now Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, st stop here for a second. Think about this. Notice what he says. He said, now, it said, Jacob, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, being weary with his journey, sat thus on the well. Now, when you say sat thus, now, I thought this was really amazing, because, you know, textually, this shows how accurate the Bible is. Because he said, John, now, when John wrote this, John didn't write it. John dictated it to his students, his disciples. And so they were writing it, so John is telling the story. Now, if this wasn't true, no one would think to write this. But the fact this is there proves it's true. Because he says, now, Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. Now, when you read that, sat thus on the well didn't tell you anything. Right? Didn't make any sense even. Sat thus on the well. But when you read it and you realize what he was doing, he was telling the story. And he was telling it to his disciples and they're writing it down. Now, he said, now Jacob's well was there and Jesus being weary of his journey, he sat thus on the well. He demonstrated to the disciples how Jesus sat. That's why he said he sat thus. 
See? Now, the disciples were so accurate in how they wrote it down, they didn't write down how Jesus sat. They wrote down exactly, word for word, what John said, which was, he sat thus on the well. And that shows you how accurate the Bible is, that they didn't even take the liberty to write in what they saw. They wrote what John said. Amen? Just shows you how accurate. All right. Didn't mean anything about healing, but it's just neat. Okay? So, he says, Then, comes, then there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away in the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that said to him, to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. Alright? Now, <clears throat> notice the reason he said living water is because to Jewish people, Living water means running water. Okay? See, a Jewish person would never baptize the way we do. In a bathtub. You know, just still water. Because their idea was, and that's why I said when, Jesus, when John baptized Jesus, he baptized him in the Jordan where there was much water because it meant the water was running. Right? He didn't baptize him in a lake. It was a river. Running water. Why? Because when you got baptized, you had to go under the water and the sins... Now, I know this sounds kind of funny in some ways, but they believe sin was like dirt. And it would rise to the surface, and as they went under, the sins would come off, and the running water would wash them away, and they would come out, and it would be clean water on them, and they'd be clean. Now, if it was just still water, when they go under, the sins rise to the top. When they come back out, the sins are still there and sticks to them. I know it sounds funny, but it's the way they thought. Okay? And Jesus said, I've asked you of drink, but if you knew who I was... You would ask me and I would give you living water, which means I'm going to give you water that's moving. Now watch this. He says, The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. Well, let me ask this first. When he said this living water, wasn't he talking about the Spirit? Later on he, he mentions that and he says, and So what does that mean? It means the Spirit's always moving. Isn't it right? So if you're not moving, you're not waiting on the Spirit. Right? He's moving. Right? And you've got to catch up with him. Okay. The woman said unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank there of himself and his children and his cattle? Now, Jesus was the only person that could have said, Yep, yeah, sure am. You figured it out, lady. But you notice, he had no ego. Because he didn't even talk about him. He went right, he skipped right over that and said, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Right? But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Do you get that? Now, now listen carefully. He said... If you drink that water, you're going to thirst again. But if you drink the water I give you, which is the Spirit, because he's talking about everlasting life, he's talking about salvation. Right? He said, and he said, look, if you drink the water that I give you, it'll be a well, it'll come up into everlasting life, and you will never thirst again. Right? Now, how many of you have heard people sing songs, Lord, I'm so thirsty. Lord, my heart pants after you like the deer. Lord, I, we live in a dry and thirsty land. Send your rain. Oh, Lord, I'm so thirsty. Lord, we thirst. Lord, we hunger. Lord, Lord, we thirst after you. Right? Okay, if, if, you're, if you've been singing that, stop it. You understand? Unless you're not born again. Only a sinner, unborn again, can sing that song. Because every... Now, you, you need to listen. I'm not just talking here and saying cute little things, okay? Jesus said, if you drink the water I give you, if you get saved and you have my spirit, you will never thirst again. And if you get down on Sunday and you start singing how you're thirsting, you are denying Christ. You are saying, I am not saved. You understand that? You're saying, I don't have his spirit. 
Now, this is real simple. There is no difference between singing a lie and telling one. Amen. Right? Is this pure enough or simple, bold, blunt, what do you want to call it? Right? Matter of fact, next time they start singing it, just stand up and go, moo. Because that is a sacred cow. Okay? <laughs> now, he says, <clears throat> the woman said, the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Now she's still thinking physical water, isn't she? I mean, she's, she's not thinking spirit. And Jesus said unto her, Go call your husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said unto her, You've well said that you don't have a husband, because you've had five husbands. And the man that you have now is not your husband. So in, the, in saying that, you've said truly. And now watch this. The woman said, said unto him, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Well, isn't that something? He just called her an adulterer or adulteress, right? He just revealed her sin. And what does she say? First thing she says, well, you're a prophet, right? Now watch this. Now you would think if he just revealed her sin, she would say, you're right. I repent. This ain't right. Got to change, right? That's what you would think. No, she was a good religious person. Watch this. The woman says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. And she goes right into the hot topic, the hot religious topic of the day. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. Okay, no mention of the sin. Right? Forget the sin, that's over here. We, we, we want to talk about this. Right? Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say, the Jews say, that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Isn't it funny how she just totally ignored the fact that he exposed her sin? Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me. The hour comes when you will neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You hear that? It's not about a place. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. In other words, it's coming through the Jews. But the hour comes and now is. Right? Hear that? It's not coming, it now is. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. Now hear that? The Father seeks. Right? Now, the Bible says that God sent His Son while we were yet in our sin. Right? He loved us before we loved Him. Right? He sought us before we sought Him. Isn't that right? Isn't it funny because we... Years ago there was a book about being a God chaser. And about how... Oh, we've got to be a God chaser. We've got to chase God. I don't know about you, but... God chased me for years. And then finally I gave up and said, you're right. And, right. and we know this because you know, we've had kids at different times. And it's like, oh, pl you know, please pray for you know, little Johnny. He's running from God. Hmm. If he's running from God, it sounds like God's chasing him. Right? Isn't it funny? We always talk about, well, we've got to be a God chaser. We've got we to gotta go after God. I'm not a God chaser. God chased me. He, you know, and I was smart enough at some point eventually to give up... He says, when he, t when he tells her, uh, okay, but the hour comes now is, and true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit. God is not spirit. He is a spirit. You understand? If God is spirit, then spiritualism is true. Right? He's not spirit. And uh, theosophy and all these other, even new age, it's all true. If that was true. But God is not spirit, because that means then everything spirit is God. But God is a spirit, which means he is a specific spirit, which means that spiritualism and new age and all that stuff is not true. Okay? All right. Now, he says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that when Messiah comes, which is called Christ, and when he has come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said unto her, now he never told anybody this, and he's talking to a Samaritan woman. And he said, he said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman. So apparently that was not all that common, really. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man which told me all things ever I did. <clears throat> Is not this the Christ? Now, it, you notice up there it says, She went to the city and said to the men, now, you know, I've always been taught that that was all the men of the city. You know, and said, everybody come out. Maybe it was the five that she'd been with. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know. It just says men, so it doesn't say which men, but 
It says, you know, you've been with five guys and the man you're with now isn't your husband. So maybe she went and gathered up all her exes and brought them out there to see him. Right? Just, you know, literal, right? <clears throat> Come see a man which, did, which told me all things ever I did is not this the Christ. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Now watch this. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him saying, Master, eat. Remember, because they went to the, into the town to get lunch. <clears throat> but he said to them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Now what's he? See, they're talking physical meat. He was talking spiritual meat. Right? So now let's see what spiritual meat is. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Has any man brought him aught to eat? And Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. You hear that? Now, let me explain this to you because you need to get this. This is one of the most important things I will teach you all week. Jesus, we've been taught, okay, milk, meat, milk, carnal, milk, babe in Christ, meat, spiritual, meat, maturity, milk, mature Christian, right? And he said, Paul said, I could not give you milk. I couldn't give you meat. I had to give you milk because you're a babe, right? You're, you're babe in Christ, you're carnal. And then in Hebrews, Paul, who wrote Corinthians, also wrote Hebrews, said, you become dull of hearing, and it said anybody that is not mature, anybody that's a babe in Christ, right? He said that you have, but if you're going to be mature and get strong meat, then you're going to have your senses exercised, right? Through reason of use and exercise, right? And now watch what he's saying. Because he told them there was no meat in Corinthians. But there's a lot of information. Now we know that the Bible says desire the sincere milk of the word that we can grow thereby. So you can grow by the milk. But there's no meat in the Bible. Why? Because milk is learning about it. Milk is being hearers of the word. See, you hear milk. But then when you become a doer of the word, Jesus said, my meat is to do. You get it? Being a hearer is milk. As long as you're just a hearer and not a doer, you will only have milk and not be meat. You will only be carnal and never be spiritual. You can only be a baby and never grow up. You will not grow by learning. You understand? You will not become mature by hearing. You mature by doing what you've heard. Your meat, you, no man can give you meat. Men can only give you the milk of the word, rightly divided. Okay? And if you take the milk of the word and you go do it, the minute you do it, it becomes meat. Amen. Right? You understand that? Yes. So don't look to any man for meat. If you don't have meat, it's because you're not doing what you've been told and what you've been taught and what the word of God says. See, <clears throat> for you to get... Okay, if meat is maturity, and you have to wait till somebody gives you meat, then your maturity is based on what somebody else does. But, if milk is the word of God, and you can grow by it, and meat is doing it, then it's your choice when you want to grow up. You get it? Yeah. That's why you need to realize this. What Paul was trying to tell them is, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Exactly what James was trying to say. So it's not about... See, when you hear the word, you're hearing milk. You're not hearing meat. When you decide to go do what you've heard, it becomes meat. Now, when you eat food, <clears throat> generally... I have to be careful how I say this, but... You're not supposed to eat... <clears throat> to eat. Okay? <clears throat> That's, that can be a disorder. It can actually be a problem. Right? That's why America is the most overfed and undernourished people in the world. Right? We eat more than anybody else, but our food has less nutritional value. Okay? That's why I tell everybody, and I said everybody because I tell them, I don't eat vegetables. I've never eaten a vegetable, never tasted a vegetable, don't want to, have no in inclination. Never have. I live off really meat, well, potatoes, and, but potatoes in a, in a, it's not a vegetable. Okay? Uh, ask the Irish, and they'll tell you, nope, it, it's a staple of food. Okay? But, what you have to realize is that, that's why I tell everybody, I li now, we went to eat today at a Chinese restaurant. Was there any vegetables anywhere near my plate? None, right? <laughs> Big plate of meat, yes. 
That's how would I live. Now, because I'm, I'm always on the road, I live off fast food. I live off Cokes and chips and meat, and I don't eat vegetables. I, you know, if I thought to take vitamins for a long time, I carried a bag of vitamins around with me, and the best thing, the best, uh, you know, value I got out of them was the exercise of carrying them from the, my car to the motel room because I always forgot to take them. So, you know, if I had them, I'd think about it, and if I did, I'd take them, but I'm not against that. But uh, that's why I tell you, what I teach works, right? Because I have to believe in divine healing, right? But based on the way I eat and how I live. Now, to be honest with you, that, and that's why I get it, because people are like, well, I'm going to pray that you'll quit Cokes. Stop it, that's witchcraft, right? That's against my will, and someday maybe you'll have enough faith that you can drink any deadly thing and it won't hurt you either. Right? So, what the Bible says, right? Okay. Now, but now I understand. I, it's funny because now, to have a healing ministry, you don't have to do anything with healing. All you've got to do have is a degree in exercise physiology and a degree in nutrition. Because that's all there is in the church about healing. Take these vitamins, take these supplements, eat this way, eat that way, exercise. That's, that's all there is. Why? Because most people can't produce it. Right? And the funny thing is, all the people that are eating that way are in my healing line. Right? So apparently it ain't working. Now I know it does to some degree, and you know, it's better to eat right than not to. Alright? But it's so funny because people try to get me to change, and they're asking me for prayer. Right? And I am healthy. I, man, I'm, I mean, you would not believe how healthy I am. I'm healthy, you know, just turned 50. Most of the time, feel 25, especially when I'm around my, my grandkids. I got four grandkids, and you know, we run through the house and jump over furniture, and you know, all kinds of stuff. My wife, we, my wife and I have had four children. Our first one died when she was almost almost three. Hadn't told that story yet, but the other uh, three are all grown. Two of them are married. Two of them have children. And the two that are married have children. The one that's not married doesn't have a child. But you know, I, I say that for her benefit. She'll be watching this, and she'll be saying, "You need to clarify." You know, but. The funny thing is, my, my wife will say, you know, because she said, I've actually raised four kids. I raised those three, and I'm still raising you. Because that's what she feels, because she said, you're my biggest kid. Because, you know, I, I hadn't told you about when I got hit by a car and all that kind of stuff. But when they put me back together, my wife said, you know, when the doctor puts you back together, he left out the common sense. You know, and, and when, when God put you back in, he left out common sense. And I'm like, well, if he left it out, he must have fig figured it wasn't that, you know, important. And she goes, that's why God uses you. And I said, why? And she goes, because you are just like a little child. She said, you think that way? <laughs> and you just think so simple. And I'm like, hey, it's working for me. Right? Why change? You know? So, I'm just telling you, all the things, I, I told you before, all the things you think you have to do to walk in power, or to walk in healing, or anything else, I have done exactly the opposite and proven that it's not true. Amen? Now, I'm not telling you don't eat right, but, but honestly, it's hard to. Because it's hard to even find food that has nutritional value. Right? Because of everything that's going on. But the thing is, and I'm not against nutrition, I'm not... I was a, a fitness consultant at a Bally's. And, I, and when I was in martial arts, I, did, I had to study Chinese herbalism to know what did what, and my students would come in, and I could put stuff together and fix them up and all that kind of stuff. I did all that. And, and the thing is, when it comes down, and I'm not against necessarily you doing stuff or, you know, taking herbs or vitamins. Or not. It's, the whole thing comes down to is, where's your faith? And I'm not saying if you take those, you don't have faith. I'm not saying, I'm saying, where do you put your faith? You know, if your faith is in those things, then don't call it divine healing. It's not divine healing. It's natural healing. All right? And you say, well, God started it. Yeah, but that's not divine healing. That's not what Jesus... Jesus didn't prescribe herb, herbs. Okay? He didn't prescribe 30 minutes of exercise three times a day. He set people free. That's what we're talking about. Right? Now, honestly, if you... Let me... See, it's real simple. <clears throat> if you exercise three times a week, 20, 30 minutes... I'm talking about just walking. Just take a walk. Do that. Right? And if you took your plate of food... Every time you eat, just take your plate, load it up like you want to, you know, like you normally do, then walk over, take about half of it, and rake it off in the trash. And if you ate that way, most of your problems would go away. Right? Just from a strictly natural viewpoint. Now, if they didn't, if you had a particular illness, you can actually fast 
And by fa- and I'm not talking about just the power of God. I'm talking about just natural fasting. In, something anybody can do, not just Christians. You can fast, and most diseases, if not all, will be cured if you fast long enough, basically. Now, of course, you fast long enough, everything's cured. <laughs> You're gone. But, okay, but, <laughs> but that's not what I'm talking about. Okay? I'm saying if you fast long enough, it, then that would stop it. You understand? These are just basic things. But that's not what we're here to talk about. I could go into nutrition. I could go into exercise. I could do all that stuff. I've taught it. But I've found a better way. You know? Because I can't always exercise. And you can't always eat right. And if you're going to be, if you're going to go to the mission field, you can't always get a a balanced meal. You know? And, And honestly, if you're sick and you go to the mission field, obviously sickness isn't the will of God because you can't always get the medicine you need there. All right? So God desires divine healing. That's His best. Okay? Well, doctors are God's way of healing. No, they're not. You know? Thank God for them as much as they can do and all that, but they're not God's way. All right? It would be ridiculous for God to go from a perfect system to a flawed system. All right? Jesus healed them all. That's God's system. All right? Now... At the same time, you do, a, do research on, medical, on the medical practice, right? And the medical profession. It is, basically, everything about it came from Egypt. Almost every bit of it, all right? And if you look back and you look at some of the, the, the symbology that they have, even the, the, the pole that the serpent's on, and you look, and, and originally it had two serpents, right? Okay, the only time in the Bible where there was mention of two serpents, is in Pharaoh's court. Right? Remember Moses came in with his rod and it became a serpent? And Pharaoh's two magicians came in and they had two rods and it became two serpents. So when you see two serpents, that doesn't mean God. That's Pharaoh's court. That's Egypt. You understand? And then you go back and look and what's his name? Archelaus or something. Some, I can't remember it now, but it's something like that. That he was the one they base it on. And you go back and study and everything that goes along with it and where it came from and the healing arts and all that. And it, and ba- Okay, there is no difference. Now let me ask you this. Maybe I should I just ask you. What is the difference between a pharmacist and a witch doctor? A white coat. Isn't that it? Isn't that the only difference? The pharmacist wears a white coat. Right? Because the pharmacist does the same thing. He mixes potions that is designed to cause a certain reaction in a person's body. That's what a witch doctor does. Right? And they mix potions and they do different things. And to be honest with you, in some cases, their remedies are better than the pharmacist. Right? You say, well, what do you mean pharmacist? Well, the, the word from, in the Greek is pharmakia, which means sorcery. That, that's what pharmacy, that's where it came from. And it means literally sorcery or witchcraft. Right? Look it up. So, see, when, when we started, I, my first daughter died due to pneumonia. That's what killed her. Okay? Now, she had some other problems that we were fighting, but that didn't kill her. She died of pneumonia. When she got sick, we called the doctor. And you say, oh, that's where your animosity... No, no, you got to understand. It's not true, but I, but I do understand, you know, there is a situation there. We called the doctor and said, this is what's going on. He said, what's her, temp- to her uh, temperature? We gave him the temperature. And he said, all right, because it's about 11.30. 11.30, 12, almost 12 o'clock at night. He said, all right, well, keep her cool. Bring her in the morning. I'll see her in the morning. Okay? <clears throat> Everything seemed to be okay. We were going to go ahead and do that. Uh, I got up in the morning. I was working a construction job. Went to work. When my wife woke up, went in and checked on my daughter, she was dead. Right? Now, when she went in and checked on her, she had been dead long enough that rigor mortis had set in. And so when she walked in, we had this little playpen thing that she slept in, had a thing in it, and there's a reason for that. But anyway, when she went in, I didn't notice at first, but when she went in and found my daughter dead, my daughter's arm, now she was laying on her back, right? Laying flat on her back. But her arms were like this. Now, when she died... She opened her arms for something to receive her. All right? You understand? And she was in that position. And that sounds horrible, but when we took her to the, to the hospital, I mean, to the, uh, when they came and got her, uh, they actually had to 
basically break her arms to put them down by her side because they were, they were frozen there. And so <clears throat> many times she would be sitting and playing and all of a sudden look up and I mean, I know she was dealing with angels. I know she was talking to them and everything else, and she would play with them. But this, every time she did that, she used to say, because <clears throat> like I said, she was almost three. Yeah, about a little over two. And she would say, when you walked in there, she would say, I want to take you. That was her, you know, and not, would you take me? It's, I want to take you. And that's what she would do. So I'm sure that when she died, an angel came to get her, and that's what she did. Because she was always talking with angels. I mean, it, was, it happened pretty regular. Some strange things going on. But anyway, so... <clears throat> Immediately Now, I'd already been learning faith because she had had other problems. Uh, uh, actually, she had a hemangioma tumor that she was the, the first child. She's in the 1978, no, 70, yeah, 78 medical journal, the AMA, AMA medical journal, because she was born with a hemangioma tumor that was the size of my fist when she was born. And it was in her tongue, which made her tongue outside of her mouth. It's very horrible to look at. It was very big blood red, and a hemangioma tumor is a tumor made up of a bunch of blood vessels kind of in a knot, okay? And you could see this. Her tongue was like any other tongue, very thin. But it was large with the skin over the skin. But you could see this in there, and then she moved, it would move. It looked, like a, it looked like a bag of snakes is what it looked like, right? And there was a lot of details and stuff like that, but maybe we'll get more into it later on is, if we need to. But the thing I want you to understand is that we had been learning faith. We were beating this thing. When she was born, it was huge, and we, it was getting smaller. The doctor said she could never grow teeth. If, it, if she did, it would bite into it, and she'd bleed to death in less than five minutes. They said that she'd never be able to eat regular food, and if she slept wrong, her tongue would cover air passage, so they had to put a tracheotomy in her throat. Me and my, my wife had to actually go to a John Seeley Hospital in Galveston and study nursing to a degree to be able to suction out the mucus in her throat so that she wouldn't you know, suffocate and all that kind of stuff. And when you pull this trach out, you had to do this and replace it within a certain amount of time where she could suffocate. Okay, my wife and I was uh, 18 and 19 at that time, right? And my wife, first baby, and we're having to go through all this. My wife is having to become a nurse and take care of this baby. That ain't right, right? We didn't, for the first six months, she was in intensive care, and the best we could do is walk in, look in this little incubator type thing, and, you know, rub her. We couldn't hold her. And it is not right for parents not to be able to hold their baby. Amen? And that six months was six months stolen. You never get that back. And, and then people say, well, why do you have such a hatred for sickness? Let me show you some pictures. Let me show you. I, I, I've, got a, I've got a grave in McKinney, Texas with her name on it. And when the day she died, she died on February the 13th, which was a Friday. And when she died, we had to bury, the, bury her the next day because they weren't sure what her tongue was going to do. And they didn't want any problems. So we buried her the next day, which is February 14th, which is Valentine's Day. Which tends to make Valentine's Day different for us than it does, you know, other people sometimes. And so we'd gone through this. We'd studied healing. I'd, I'd, we'd, I had everybody's tapes, everybody's books, everybody's stuff on this. And it was working, but not good enough. And so when she died, when we stood there... Everybody came out. Everybody said everything. Typical stuff. Well, God needed another flower in heaven. And I, I told him real quick, God didn't do this. This was a devil. He stole my daughter's life and I'm going to make him pay. And so when I stood at that cemetery grave, they, they put her this little white casket down in the ground. And they usually want you to walk off before they do that if you can because parents kind of freak out sometimes when you do it. <clears throat> but we convinced them to let us stay there. And whenever they put that down, everybody else had gone away. just me and my wife was there. And when they put that down and they were going to start covering up the, the coffin, I stood there and I, I made a vow to God. I said, God, there was, because I called everybody. Everybody, I've been buying all their tapes. I've been calling them. I couldn't reach one of them. Right? I got their secretaries. And, you know, the first thing the secretary said, oh, do you want to make a donation? Right? I'm like, no, I want you to get a hold of this guy and tell him to come raise my daughter up. He's talking about faith. He's talking about this stuff. I need him. Uh, he's busy right now. He's in a conference. I'm like, oh, I think this is a little more important than the conference. And I had one secretary tell me, well, she's in a better place. Well, there's no doubt about that, but that's not your call. It's my call. She's my daughter, not your daughter. Now go tell the man I want to talk to him. Well, I can't disturb him. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I bet if I was writing a $25,000 check, I bet I could get him on the phone. Well, that was, that was 25 years ago. Now it'd be, you know, have to be a quarter million probably. 
to actually talk to the man himself. And we went back. So I stood there at that grave after these, you know, after that day of trying to call everybody. And I said, God, there was no man for me when I needed one. But if you will teach me, I will be that man for somebody else someday so that they don't have to have a grave like I do. And since that time, we've gone around the world, 30 countries. I've laid hands personally on over 70,000 people. We have a 94 to 97% success rate on everything. I mean, you name it, it's across the board. And, and we've seen nine come back from the dead. We've seen every type of sickness, every type of disease, every part of the human body, you name it. We've pretty much seen it. If we've ever come into contact with it, we beat it. All right? Now, I'm not saying we've won every time, but I'm saying there's no disease that has consistently defeated us. We have consistently defeated every other disease. Amen? Amen. See, that's why I talk the way I do. Because I'm absolutely convinced. This is what I found that has allowed us to do what we do. That's why I talk this way. That's why I'm so adamant about getting you to do it. Because I know there are people out there today, right now, you're, you're going to pick up the paper tomorrow and there's going to be obituaries. And it, the hardest thing is coming into a place where they said, and then somebody comes up and says, I, I just buried somebody last week. And, this, and what you're saying here, you're telling me it's my fault? Because I couldn't get him here. I'm like, yeah, you know, if you want to look at it that way. But I said, but I apologize for not getting here faster. I'm sorry I didn't get here sooner. Because if I'd have got here sooner, you wouldn't have a grave. But it comes back down to, what are you going to do with this? Because this is real. Amen? Y'all go home. We'll see y'all tomorrow morning. We will get the rest of this done. We got